But not all organisms do this. Um, this is a creosote bush you, not far from 15, Interstate 15, which you take from here to uh, Las Vegas, where probably you would be engaged in activities that would shorten your lifespan. Um, this is just one of a whole bunch of plants and animals that don't undergo aging at all. Um, to evolutionary biologists, uh, the reasons for this are fairly straightforward. Um, in organisms that evolve by strictly symmetrical fissile reproduction, that's splitting exactly in two with no product of the division being specially favored or disfavored, uh, natural selection stays strong. Uh, because if it didn't, basically that lineage would go extinct. And evolution, therefore, gets rid of the problem of aging. Um, and what this tells those of us who are evolutionary biologists is that the molecular and cell biology of eukaryotic cells has nothing to do with the fundamental cause of aging whatsoever. Not telomeres, not metabolic damage, none of those things. All of those are things that evolution can readily solve. Um, so we explain aging in completely different terms. Uh, basically, um, aging is when evolution by natural selection starts to care less, like the uh, long-suffering uh, Rhett Butler vis-a-vis -vis Scarlett O'Hara. Um, and this is not a verbal formalism, of course, not a verbal, I should say, not a verbal formula. It is a mathematical result which derives from first principles. And if you have a population with a reproductive pattern like ours, you will inevitably age according to evolutionary theory. And the key equations are Hamilton's forces of natural selection, one of which I plot here, which are defined most importantly by two parameters, little b, the first age of reproduction in a population, not the first time you got lucky, and the last age of reproduction in a population, little d, the parameter that Hugh Hefner is working on as we speak. <laughs> um, before the first age of reproduction in a population, natural selection is uniformly powerful in terms of keeping you alive. After the last age of reproduction of any individual in a population, natural selection truly doesn't give a damn, Scarlett, and uh, for a long time, we thought that meant that you would necessarily die really fast. It turns out we were wrong about that interpretation. And when, when we've done more explicit simulations of this evolutionary process, uh, which my colleague Larry Muller and I started doing in the mid-1990s, we discovered that instead what you got was the end of aging and the end of this period of deterioration. Um, for some species, particularly some insect species that have been studied, there is a, can be a very prolonged post-aging phase of life. In humans, there is a very limited uh, post-aging survival. Uh, but that is still fundamentally the reason why we have so many supercentenarians, Stephen Coles. And your beautiful data, which your group published in Re Aubrey's uh, Rejuvenation Research, are a beautiful vindication, of course, of the evolutionary theory of late life or biological immortality. But that's not my topic today. I'm just giving you that to, to frame this equation, uh, which is plotted there. So basically what this means is the timing of reproduction controls the evolution of aging. And just to be crude about it, we have an uh, animation. Um, basically, if a gene is going to kill you with certainty and it kills you before reproduction, natural selection will completely clean it out. After the last age of reproduction, if a gene will kill you with complete certainty, natural selection doesn't care, and things get ugly. Um, and in between, you have that smooth transition.